preaching a little message on follow me as we talked about Christ and how he said to his disciples, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. The focus was following him. And uh, Isaiah 53 is one of these prophetic utterances from the prophet Isaiah. Happened many hundreds of years before Christ even walked this earth. And this passage of scripture includes the gospel message, or at least Christ as that suffering servant when he offered himself for the sins of all mankind. And this was spoken, like I said, far in advance. And some of these events, when they finally came to fruition in Christ as he stood upon uh, Golgotha and he hung from Calvary's tree, he couldn't have possibly fulfilled these things in and of himself. It had to have been the hand of God. So we're going to read through this passage get an insight of what it's like to follow Jesus. Isaiah chapter 53, the Bible says, Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Because he had done no violence, neither was deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Turn to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. That was just to set the tone, seeing our Christ as a suffering servant, seeing the way he was carried, bruised, beaten, all the way to that tree that he went to willingly so that he could please God. The wrath of God fell upon him and not upon us. That's the gospel message there. Christ Jesus died to save sinners of whom I am chief, as the Apostle Paul put it. Now over there in Matthew, chapter 4, let's read verse 17. From that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Okay, the first thing we need to make sure that we know and are aware of in regard to following Jesus, which is what I want to focus on, verse 19 clearly, And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers. Of men. The first thing we want to make sure is that we have the right message. When Christ came out in Matthew chapter 4, it was after a great temptation of the Spirit in the wilderness. Through that temptation and that trial, the devil came to him with, with many things he laid before him and said, If thou art the Son of Man, do such and such. If thou art God, do such and such. And Jesus always responded with the Scriptures, the Word of God, from Deuteronomy specifically. When he was 
revealed after this great temptation that the, the devil leaveth him and behold angels came and ministered unto him at that time he immediately began to preach this message repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand in mark chapter 1 and verse 15 it's put this way the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of god is at hand repent ye and believe the gospel now jesus here comes out in his primary focus for even being on earth the only reason why he would go through such a temptation with the devil and that trial is so that he could bring men through his preaching to repentance to change their mind actively from the unbelief or from their doubt or from their trusting in anything other than him and turn to believing on him only for their salvation and for their access to the kingdom of heaven which christ says is at hand and the reality is if the kingdom of heaven isn't arrived yet because we still live in the kingdom of canada in the kingdom of this world or whatsoever the reality is is that the kingdom of hand is at hand for anybody and anyone at any moment you don't know when you could die and breathe your last breath and so christ comes out and says repent ye for the kingdom of heaven is at hand and here we are two thousand years after that sermon was preached and there's going to be scoffers in these days saying, where is the promise of his coming? Where is the promise of this kingdom? That's what Peter told us in the New Testament. The reality is, is like I said, that promise is coming. God's not slack, as men should count slackness. He promised it's coming, right? But since then, how many thousands, how many millions have died, breathed their last breath and entered into eternity and found themselves in a kingdom that's at hand. And so God comes out and he says, repent and believe the gospel. Turn from your unbelief to faith in Christ alone. And we ultimately must preach to that end. That ought to be our goal. That ought to be our heartbeat because it was Christ's heartbeat. As soon as he entered into the ministry, from that time Jesus began to preach from the moment that he finished his temptation. And as he started to gather his followers unto himself he began to preach that message repent and believe the gospel the good news that christ jesus is going to die for your sins as he hath promised and as was revealed there in isaiah chapter 53 now the focus then of this portion of scripture in the next few weeks is follow me and i will make you fishers of men that's verse 19 okay you can read in the second part of verse 18 it says, let's just read the whole thing. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting in a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And then he says unto them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. So these brothers were casting in nets. They were doing fishing things. Why? Because they were fishers. The Bible is very clear. It makes sense, right? They were fishing because they were fishers. And then Jesus comes to them and he says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. To date, they were fishing for fish, of course. And so they were probably wondering what this thing might be. Nevertheless, look at verse 20. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. Why would they do such a thing? Well, because of the preaching that went on beforehand. They knew of the coming Savior. They knew of the coming Messiah. They knew of John the Baptist saying, this is the voice. I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. And this is the Christ. This is the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. And they had heard John testifying that this is the Savior. And so when he came and said, drop your fishing equipment. I'm going to make you fishers of men. They said, okay. And they dropped it and set off on that journey. Now, fishers do fishing things. In following Christ, same is true. We ought to be doing Christian things. Being a Christian, the Bible also calls it a saint. It also, the Bible also calls it the called. We call ourselves Baptists because we hold to scriptures only and other tenets as a result of being Baptists. Here, our desire, I think, would be to be fishers of men, even as the apostles are, and that's what we're going to get to. But as such, we need to do what Christ does. As Christians do what Christ does, even as a fisherman does what, does what fishermen do, right? So how do we do that? Well, we follow him. Back in Isaiah, as we read in, in chapter 53, it called Jesus despised, rejected, stricken, oppressed, 
men of sorrows, wounded. Does that sound like a great path to follow in? Does that sound like a comfortable journey to go upon? No, it doesn't. But in the same parallel passage of Matthew chapter 4 here, in Luke chapter 5, it says, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. A promise of God there. But it's all conditional on one, one thing. Follow him, and he will make you fishers of men. Fear not. Why? From henceforth thou shalt catch men. Why? Because God promised it so. And this ought to be our journey. And if we are willing to follow, God will do what he promised. No one has ever followed Christ and not caught men. No one has ever followed Christ and not became a fisher of men. There are many, there are many substitutes, cheap substitutes for catching men. Right? The truth is, in following Christ, you become what Christ is. If you're willing to follow. And look, verse 20 says, And straightway they left their nets and followed him. Look at verse 22. It talks about after he finds uh, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, the same call goes out to them. And verse 22 says, And they immediately left the ship and their father and followed him. They dropped it all, including their dad, and just left to follow after Jesus. Now these, they forsook their father. They forsook their homes. They forsook their jobs. Not everybody has that call, mind you, but we need to be willing. Whatever Christ says, go to Matthew chapter 10. Whatever his requirement is, where he leads, we ought to follow. If you want to be a fisher of men, Matthew chapter 10. Look at verse 37. Matthew chapter 10, verse 37. See, there's a cost to being a Christian. You'll be despised, you'll be stricken, you'll be rejected, you'll be oppressed, you'll be full of sorrows, you'll be wounded. But <laughs> what you reap in life everlasting is, is far beyond any loss that you may suffer here. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 37, the Bible says, He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it. And he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. You want that life that Christ has to offer. Your life, it's not that good. <laughs> my life is not that good, even on my best days, right? But Christ's life and the life that he offers, that eternal life comes when I forsake my life when I figuratively forsake my father, forsake my mother, forsake my children, forsake all, so that I can follow Christ. And like I said, Christ doesn't ask everybody to forsake all of these things. And the hatred that he's asking for in regard to your father and your mother and your children and everybody else here is a, is a love that is by comparison. Your love for God and following after Christ ought to be such that every other relationship just looks like hatred. It also puts the right focus there, and, and your willingness is directed at God. Now, what normally happens is when my willingness and my heart to follow after God is directed towards God, He encourages me to love, to a lesser extent maybe, my wife, my children. My, but the bigger my love for God, the bigger my life will be for my family members. And that ought to be the goal. And if I'm forsaking what is mine in my life, I will find Christ's life as I look after him and seek after him. Going back to Matthew chapter 4. We're not all called to forsake all, but we are called to follow him, especially if you want to be a fisher of men. And here's our first point. Jesus says, follow me, and where he's going is to the common people. To the common people. Verse 23, it says, And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of sickness, and all manner of disease among the people. And his fame went out through all Syria, and they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with diverse diseases and torments, and those which were possessed with devils, and those which were lunatic, and those which had the palsy, and he healed them. So here Jesus is willingly going to the sick, going to the disease, going to those with the palsy, going to those that are tormented, possessed, 
lunatic. In other words, they've lost their mind completely and they're no, not even a remnant of a human essentially anymore because they, the lunatic of Gadara acted as if a beast was what he was. And Christ is going to these, and why do I say that these are common people? Well, because your average, everyday, common Joe has something wrong with them, has issues that may or may not be on this list, but they're in trouble, and they're sick, and they're taken, and they're suffering. And these are the ones that Christ went to. And in our, our economy these days, and in our, in our world as that gap of, of rich and poor gets bigger and bigger and bigger, we all find ourselves falling into what's known as the common people. How hardly it is for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And the, that is true, and we've experienced that as we go to preach the gospel unto people and we try to get them saved. That the rich people often just don't want to hear it. Why? Because they don't have issues. But here Jesus is going to those that do have issues. The truth is they have issues. They just won't admit it. And quite often they got the money that pay them right out of the issue but the poor, but the, the maimed, the sick, those that, are, those that are taken with various and diverse diseases. These are the ones that Christ went to. Why? I believe because they're more receptive. They're ready to hear. The Bible says, we can continue on in verse 25, and there followed him great multitudes of people from Galilee and from Decapolis and from Jerusalem and from Judea and from beyond Jordan. There was a great multitude that came out of Christ ministering to these that were sick and diseased and in trouble and going through some things. Look, Christ just started preaching. He just gathered to himself a few disciples. He comes and he preaches the gospel of the kingdom and heals a few and suddenly there's a multitude. So there's something to it. There's something to Christ going to the common people. And he wants us to follow him in that direction. He gains a following by following and seeking after these and to minister unto them. And then eventually when he gathers in, ver in chapter 5, his disciples unto him, which I believe the Sermon on the Mount primarily was aimed at, he brings his disciples unto him as he's trying to get away kind of from the multitude. Imagine they just started following Jesus and, and, and they're trying to learn something from him and there's just all this multitude all around him. So the Bible says in verse 1 of chapter 5, in seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came unto him and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying. So where I, what I think that plays out as is Jesus sees the multitude. He's like, I just found these disciples. I need to teach them. So he goes up into a mountain, gets away from the multitude. When he gets set, his disciples come to him. Then he begins to teach this. I think by the end of it, the multitudes eventually find him and they throng him again. But immediately the, the context of the Sermon on the Mount, I believe, is Christ to his disciples. And the first thing he wants to say to his disciples is, blessed are the poor. Blessed are they that mourn. Blessed are the meek. Right? He's talking about just basic general people that are going through some things. The common folk. He teaches blessed are the poor. He teaches blessed are the meek. Why? Because they're reachable. Because such is the kingdom of heaven. It's theirs. They shall inherit the earth. Right? That's contrary to what the world teaches, but that's the truth. Why would they inherit all these things? Why would they have the kingdom of God? Because they're ready, ready to receive it when it's offered to them. They're receptive to it. Uh, turn to Leviticus chapter 19. Leviticus chapter 19. Keep your... Oh, you can turn there. We'll be going around a little bit. Leviticus chapter 19. Hope you'll be gracious with me if I, if I go over our usual end time. I'm going to try not to. Leviticus chapter 19, as you go there, let me read Proverbs 19 and verse 17. He that hath pity on the poor lendeth unto the Lord, and that which he hath given will he pay him again. So lending to the poor, giving to the poor, helping the poor, the Bible says that it's, it's, it's a no-loss scenario. The Bible says that when we give to the poor, we're actually lending to the Lord. He's using that in the midst and doing things with it. But the Bible also says that that which you have given, God will pay you again. I don't think it's instantaneous. I don't think it's, it's, it's all the time something that we see. But certainly, whether you don't re receive of the reward in this life, there will be rewards in that which is to come. Bottom line is it's always profitable to give to the poor. That's how we gain as we give. That's how, that's how Christians ought to live their lives. Back in Leviticus chapter 19, look in verse 9. 
The Bible says, And when ye reap the harvest of your land, thou shalt not wholly reap the corners of thy field, neither shalt thou gather the gleanings of thy harvest. And thou shalt not glean thy vineyard, neither shalt thou gather every grape out of thy vineyard. Thou shalt leave them for the poor and stranger. I am the Lord your God. The common people, the poor people, were to be left an amount in the field. Don't be greedy. Don't go and harvest and pull everything in. But it says here that thou shalt leave them for the poor and stranger. It also doesn't say gather what was left and just hand it to the poor and the stranger. No, it says leave it in the field so that they can go and get for themselves. The Bible says if a man will not work, neither should he eat. So if he doesn't want to go and get the gleanings of the field, then they'll just rot out there and he'll starve to death. But if he's willing, the Bible is teaching that we ought to have a prepared amount left aside in order to minister to the poor. That's what I see here. So be prepared to help those that are in need. Be prepared to leave something aside for them. When you reap, there ought to be something available to give at the end of the day is what God is trying to hear. Leave it there so that they can get it. There's a lot ready. We have a lot prepared so that we can minister to the poor. And when we minister to the poor, we'll always break even because God promises that that will return unto us again. Because all we're doing really is lending to the Lord. Turn to Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6. Matthew, Mark, Luke in the New Testament. I'm giving us some general principles here about, about giving. I'm trying to follow Christ now. Luke chapter 6 and verse 38. The Bible says, Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, and shaken together, and running over, shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that ye meet withal, it shall be measured to you again. Now that's a faith position, isn't it? Because you've got to give in order to get, right? we also got to make sure we're not giving in order to get. We give out of a compassionate heart that wants to help and bless others. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together and running over. Here the Bible promises that men shall give into your bosom. In other words, whatever you give, that same vessel is returning unto you, but it's shaken, it's pressed down, it's completely full and spilling over. That's how God blesses his own who give. And that's just a general principle that we can take and apply into all manners of giving. Now, how important is this then? Is this just a minor command? Is this just something we can glass over and think, yeah, I should, uh, I should give more, I should give more of this once, and then, and then that's good, that's enough. Or is it something that we should be consistently and diligently working after? Well, the Lord said it, so we've got to ask ourselves, how important is it? It's red over there, isn't it, Brother Tristan, in your Bible? It's red. So Jesus Christ said that while he was on this earth. Luke chapter 6 then, in verse 46, is also the Lord speaking. And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them, I will show you whom he is like. So that's a good question. Why do we call him Lord? Why do we pray unto him and say, Lord, do this, do that, help me with this, help me with that, but we're not doing what he says. That's important. We ought to reflect on those. And so these commands that are preceding this, which is from Luke chapter 6, which is also the Sermon on the Mount told from a little bit of a different angle. Why do we call him Lord, Lord, and we're not doing these things? And we're not trying to get after these things. We're not following Christ in these things. He says, but if you do them, I'll show you what you're like. Verse 48. He is like a man which built a house and digged deep and laid the foundation on a rock. When the flood arose and the stream beat vehemently upon that house and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. You got a solid and a firm foundation. Your house is not going to move when there's a vehement flood, when there's a storm that arises, when something is beating down upon that house because you dug deep and put your foundation upon the rock, which is Christ, you shall not be moved. And that is the person that does what God says. In other words, the Lord says, follow me in the area of giving to the poor, the common man. And we just simply do that. As he says, we're wise for that. 
Verse 49 says, but he that heareth and doeth not. And this is a problem. Sometimes we become forgetful hearers for we hear the word of God and then we leave it alone, straightway forget what manner of men we were. I think that if we're reflecting on these scriptures, even as they're coming across our ears today, we ought to not only hear but heed these. He that heareth and doeth not is like a man that without a foundation built in house upon the earth. And we shouldn't found it, put a foundation upon earth ever. Against which the stream did beat vehemently, and immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. Look at the contrast here. We find here it was built on earth where the wise man built his house upon a rock. We find here that there is a little stream there beating vehemently, and before there was a flood that arose and beat vehemently upon that house. We find here that there was a great ruin if you're hearing and not doing what Christ commands. And before there is something that does not shake that was founded upon the rock. And what is that rock? Saying Lord, Lord, but also doing what he says. <clears throat> so how important is it then that we do what God says? You can decide that. Psalm chapter 10. Psalm chapter 10. Now, just in regard to general principles, again, of, of dealings with the poor and how we ought to interact with the poor, the common man really is just the general idea of, of that. I mean, we're all richer than somebody, but we're also poorer than many. We're kind of on the same playing field in, in many regards. And as the middle class gets kind of eroded away, we'll all find ourselves in this category of poor and common. Psalm chapter 10, let me read through this. Why standest thou afar off, O Lord? Why hidest thyself in times of trouble? The wicked in his pride doth persecute the poor. Let them be taken in the devices that they have imagined. For the wicked boasteth of his heart's desire and blesseth the covetous whom the Lord abhorreth. The wicked through the pride of his countenance will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. His ways are always grievous. Thy judgments are far above out of his sight. As for all his enemies, he puffeth at them. He hath said in his heart, I shall not be moved, for I shall never be in adversity. But we just read that this one's not building his rock upon obedience to Christ, and he will be moved, won't he? A little stream beats through. Verse 7, it says, His mouth is full of cursing and deceit and fraud. Under his tongue is mischief and vanity. He sitteth in the lurking places of the village. In the secret places doth he murder the innocent. His eyes are privily or privately set against the poor. He lieth in wait secretly as a lion in his den. He layeth in wait to catch the poor. He doth catch the poor when he draweth him with his net. He croucheth and humbleth himself that the poor may fall by his strong ones. He hath said in his heart, God hath forgotten. He hateth, he hideth his face. He will never see it. Arise, O Lord, lift up thine hand, forget not the humble. Wherefore doth the wicked condemn God? He hath said in his heart, thou wilt not require it. Thou hast seen it. And thou beholdest mischief and spite to requite it with thy hand. The poor committeth thyself unto thee. Thou art the helper of the fatherless. Break thou the arm of the wicked and evil man. Seek out his wickedness till thou find none. The Lord is king forever and ever. The heathen are perished out of his land. Lord, thou hast heard the desire of the humble. Thou wilt prepare their heart. Thou wilt cause thine ear to, to judge the fatherless and the oppressed. And the man of the earth may no more oppress. God's desire is that men would not oppress one another. And here the wicked, the, the, the rich of this world, those that are in power and in control, are lying secretly in wait for the poor so that they can destroy them. What has the poor done to him? Yet he croucheth himself and humbleth himself, hiding down that he could destroy. His heart is fully set against God, and this is ultimately the problem. But God will one day fully set his heart against them as he beholdeth the mischief and spite and will requite it with his own hand. He will break the arm of the wicked and evil men that seek out wickedness. Why? Because God wants there to be no more oppression unto these poor and these needy. 
As much as the wicked hate, despise, and abuse the poor, so much the more God cares and judges on behalf of the poor. And why is that? Verse 14, it says, to require it with thine hand, it says, the poor committeth himself unto thee. And that's the thing, is the poor are always ready to commit themselves unto God, to call upon him, to ask him for salvation, whether it's temporal or eternal. I used to spend a lot more time, and I need to get back into it, with, with people that are in the streets and poor and needy. And when you talk to them, somebody that's lived in the streets, they aren't atheists. It's like that old saying, there's no atheists in the foxholes. When people face certain death, when people struggle, when people strive and have difficulties in this life, often they are more receptive to the idea that there is a maker, there is a creator, there is a God above, and he's in control. And they're willing to commit themselves unto him. Of course, poor people can get proud just as much as rich people. But look what the tendency is. Marvel not on these things, but more often than not, the rich are persecuting the poor and they're closed off to receiving God and committing themselves to Him. The common people hear God more gladly and commit themselves to Him. Now, how does this apply to us being fishers of men then? Well... We're talking about giving. <clears throat> What's the greatest gift you can give to the poor? The common man. Salvation. And that's what Christ came out with. Repent and believe the gospel. Salvation. Common, poor, downtrodden, sick. They all seem to hear him gladly because suddenly there was a multitude about him where he had first four. <laughs> because he came to them and helped them and healed them and took care of them and showed them they had worth. And then preach the gospel unto them. So we can follow in the Lord's ministry to them. We can help. We can heal. We can give. We can even do miracles. Now, what are these miracles that Jesus did? For the poor, look at Matthew chapter 11. <clears throat> you know, Jesus said, Greater works than these shall you do. Referring to his own works in this world. I believe we can do miracles. We can take part in God doing miracles, certainly. Look at Matthew chapter 11. I'm going to start reading from verse 3. And said unto him, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? Now this was John the Baptist there in prison asking about the works of Christ. He sent two disciples, and they asked him, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? I think here, it wasn't John doubting, but John just trying to have his disciples Stop lingering around him in prison and start actually following Christ. That was what he was trying to do. So they went and they, instead of John, who was wise enough to know that they wouldn't just go on their own behalf, but they needed to be kind of tricked into it a little bit. <clears throat> art thou we, art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? That, that faith that John had needed to become the faith that those disciples had. Verse 4, Jesus answered and said to them, Go and show John again those things which ye do hear, and see. Verse 5 says, The blind receive their sight. Now watch these miracles. Watch these great works of Christ. I believe they're increasing. The blind receive their sight. That's a great thing to happen. Eyes that did not work that now can see. And the lame walk. Someone that could not walk ever is now walking just fine. The lepers are cleansed. In other words, there was a disease, an ailment upon these, the flesh of these people affecting their whole body and it's clean. It says in the deaf here. Look, it just keeps getting better. The dead are raised up. What's greater than the dead rising? The works of Christ. Somebody that was dead, not breathing. Someone checked their pulse. In some cases, they put them in the ground. When Jesus made, even made the statement that, don't worry, he'll, he'll rise. Again, he was laughed to scorn. They, they knew in their finite understanding the person was dead, and yet they were raised up. What a great miracle that was. But look, I believe the greatest of all is here. And the poor have the gospel preached unto them. What a miracle that is. That's something that's even more incomprehensible than the dead raising up. These are the spiritually dead raising up to life everlasting. But not only that, these are the poor having that opportunity given unto them. The poor that are often overlooked, rejected, refused of men. Oh, does that sound familiar? Despised stricken, rejected, oppressed, 
sorrows, wounded, as our suffering Savior was prophesied he would be in Isaiah chapter 53. So are these that are now receiving of the gospel the hand of the same Savior, from the mouth of the same Savior. So these miracles increasingly get better unto that highest of miracle that the poor have the gospel preached unto them. And where the gospel is preached, men certainly get saved. And so we need to follow Christ in that vein. Where is he going? To preach the gospel unto the common man. To preach the gospel unto the poor. To preach the gospel unto those that are sick and downtrodden. What's the practical application for us? If you want to be a follower of Christ, if you want to be a fisher of men, that's your end goal, is that you could draw men unto the Savior and see men saved. You need to follow Christ. And where is he going? To the common man. To the every man. To the poor. To the sick. To the needy. To those that everyone else refuses that's where we ought to go. To follow Christ, then, we need to go to who will listen. We also need to go to where we will be heard. Now, in Matthew chapter 4, and I'm going to send you to Acts chapter 13. In Matthew chapter 4, it said that Jesus went about all Galilee teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. He went teaching in their synagogues, and they're preaching the gospel of their kingdom. So he went to who will listen, and that was the sick, the diseased, the tormented, those possessed with devils, the lunatics, the poor in general. He went to all those and gave them the gift of eternal life, at least presented it to them. And he did so also in a place where you'll be heard. And here it's known as the synagogue, just by principle. I obviously wouldn't recommend walking into a synagogue today and trying to preach the gospel. But nevertheless, this was the open door that they had at the time. In Acts chapter 13, we're going to see that the Apostle Paul was aware of what Christ and his method was. He's following Christ to become a fisher of men in the same direction that Christ went. And that was to go to where people will listen. Acts chapter 13, look at verse 14. But when they departed from Perga and came into Antioch and Pisidia and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down, and after the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent unto them, saying, Ye men and brethren, if ye have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. And Paul stood up, beckoning with his hand, said, Men of Israel, and ye that fear God, give audience. So Jesus knew, and if we follow Jesus, to go to those that would listen, he also knew to go where we would be heard. Here for them, it was the synagogue. This was an opportunity that was given. Um, I certainly would never allow for this to just, you know, here's a visitor, come on, say whatever is on your mind. Whatever, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a whole different world, and, and they probably regretted it after we see what takes place. But nonetheless, that was their tradition at the time. So they knew, and their manner was, if we go down to the synagogue, they will read from this book, and then they'll give us opportunity to preach. They knew they'd be heard down there, and so they went where they could be heard, and the Apostle Paul was keen to this. And so he stood up, and he said, Men, give audience, and what did he begin to preach? Look at verse 26. Men and brethren, children of the stock of Abraham, and whosoever among you feareth God, to you is the word of this salvation sent. So here he's talking to those that are born after Abraham, those that fear God. They're religious. They're, they're seeking after God. Whoever God is to them, here it would be the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob they're thinking that they're serving after. But Paul's going to show them the more excellent way. The word of this salvation is sent unto you. You're seeking God. You are fearing God. You are trying to get after God best you can. And here he says, this word is sent unto you. Verse 27, for they that dwell at Jerusalem and their rulers, because they knew him not, nor yet the voice of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath day, they have fulfilled them in condemning him. And though they found no cause of death in him, yet desired they Pilate that he should be slain. And when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, and that was Isaiah chapter 53, wasn't it? There were other prophecies that went on of Christ as well. When they had fulfilled all that was written of him, and what would take place on that cross, the Bible says, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a sepulcher. But watch this, glory to God, verse 30. But God raised him from the dead. And he was seen many days of them which came up with him 
from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses unto the people. And so here's the gospel coming forth in a venue that would often have rejected it otherwise, and yet the opportunity was there so that they could preach the gospel. And we need to follow Christ and follow Paul as he followed Christ and exhorts in the New Testament in this area. He's given the opportunity to say what? Christ died. They condemned him as was prophesied. But he rose from the dead and he was seen by many. And verse 32 says, And we declare unto you glad tidings, how that the promise which was made unto the fathers, God hath fulfilled the same unto us their children, and that he hath raised up Jesus again. And it is also written in the second psalm, Thou art my Son, this day have I begotten thee. It's like 1 Corinthians 15. He's preaching it in person all over again right now as he presents the glad tidings, the gospel, the good news of Christ. And he knew that he would have an audience. He knew that he would be at least heard at this time. He knew that there was a gathering that was ready to be here. And he knew that predominantly they would be common folks there. And so he went to those that were religious and seeking after God and trying to fear God and trying to feel after God. And he presented this word unto them, this word of exhortation. Verse 38, it says, Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. And by him, by Christ, all that believe are justified from all things. So be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, he says, Forgiveness of sins is being preached unto you this day. How can you be justified? How can you be just as if you have never sinned before a holy God? You have to believe on Jesus Christ. The Bible says, from which she could not be justified by the law of Moses. You know what he's telling these, these religious people and these Pharisees and the like? He's telling them, you cannot do it by keeping the law. You cannot be justified by doing good things. You cannot be saved by simply cleaning up your life and turning from your sins. You must turn solely to Jesus Christ, believing in him, and you will be justified from all things. Verse 40 says, Beware therefore, lest that come upon you which is spoken of in the prophets. Now watch this. He's going to give them a warning because he just gave them good news, but there's a warning that comes along with it. Why is that? Because when the gospel goes forth, you need to take heed that you hear it. Because if you don't hear it, here's a warning that is coupled with it. Verse 41, Behold ye despisers, and wander and perish. For I work a work in your days, a work which ye shall in no wise believe, though a man declared unto you. He's like, look, you're religious. You're seeking after God. You're trying to find the Father. You're trying to find the Lord. You're trying to find the truth. And here I am saying it to you this day, but take heed lest ye despise it, ye reject it, and therefore perish. A man is declaring it unto you today, and you must be diligent to hear the word of God as it's preached. Verse 42 says, And when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, these Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. So the Apostle Paul was wise to know that he would have an audience of people receptive to hear the common man. He was also wise to know that the Jews would give him opportunity in their religious, uh, their religious setting to preach whatever he wanted. And therefore he took that opportunity to preach the gospel unto many and the same outcome. The Bible says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Jesus came and he said, repent and believe the gospel. And suddenly he has a great multitude following him. The apostle Paul followed in his steps and he encourages us, follow me as I follow Christ. And where's Christ going? To lead us on to being fishers of men. And he goes and he preaches where there's common men ready to hear. And he preaches unto them that same message. Repent and believe the gospel and go figure. He has a great multitude. He has caught many fish of men in this opportunity. And verse 43 says, Now when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. And so the warning went forward, but ultimately what we see is the same outcome came when, the, when, when Paul did what Jesus did. So he went to the synagogue. That was the place. That was the, the setting where there would be receptive people to hear, receptive common people. Our charge in following Christ is that we would follow him in going to the common man. 
Go to Everyday Joe. As you go about in your daily life, look for your neighbor. Look for, look for somebody standing outside of a gas station. Look for somebody waiting by their car, waiting by the bus station. You have a great opportunity riding transit like you do. Go to common people and meet with them. But what is the setting? I mean, we all have different people that we interact with and come across and everything. But what is our setting? Like I said, we're not going to go to the synagogue. We're not going to go to reach people by and large in the synagogue in this day and age. But I think we can all think of somewhere where we generally run into common people. And if we find an opportunity to take, to follow Jesus into those places, I believe we'll have opportunities to do the same. Fish for men, catch men. And this is the first thing that we find Jesus doing. He says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And what does he do? He goes to common people in a place that he'll be heard. And this is what we need to do. This is the first step in our following Christ, trying to be fishers of men, trying to revolutionize how we're going to reach people, try to find what's going to work here in Toronto. I don't know what's going to work in Toronto, but I know that if we follow Jesus, we'll be made fishers of men. Do we not want a multitude to follow after us as we're following after Jesus? Amen. That'd be a great thing to happen, to have many people hear the gospel at our mouths, and as a result, multitudes follow after Jesus and want to love him, and want to learn from him, and want to seek after him in the same way that we do. Following Christ, what did he do? Christ went where he would be heard to people that would hear him. So what do we do? Go where we'll be heard to people that will hear us. So find a place that you know will be a little bit busy. Give yourself some time and ask God to give you opportunities. Go to the bus stop. Go to the, the, the mall. Go sit in a, in a coffee shop. Go, go to your, your workplace on a lunch break or whatever. Just find opportunities where you know there will be common men that are willing to hear and just tell them, repent and believe, just like the Apostle Paul did. Someone opens up, lifts up their hand and says, hey, I'm going to give you an opportunity to give me a word of exhortation. Do you know what that is to me? Somebody just sitting down beside you on a bus and being like, oh, I'm having such a day. You know what he's saying unto you? <laughs> he's saying, if anyone has a word of exhortation, say on. Right? If you go to work and somebody's like, oh, man, my marriage is just a mess. You're sitting beside them. You know what they're saying? Does anyone have a word of exhortation? Say on. It's a common person that's just giving you an open opportunity to preach unto them. And that's where we need to go. That, that ultimately, we were just talking about it, how we go out and sometimes we knock these doors and it's just, it's, it's not common men. It's people that they, they seemingly have nothing wrong with them. They have no need. They have no issue. They have no disease or ailment or problems. They don't need you, right? The truth is they do, but they don't see it that way. So they're like the man which needeth not repentance. We need to go for that 90, not for the 90 and 9 just persons which need not repentance. We need to go for that one lost sheep of the house of Israel and seek after them. Find them while they're alone, and that's the best opportunity I find to preach to people. When they're alone, say on any word of exhortation. What should our exhortation be? Believe and be saved. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth and believe with thine heart, thou mayest. All you have to do is trust Jesus Christ and you can have eternal life and give it to people. Notice again, he just says the gospel is preached. Unto the poor, the gospel is preached. That's the miracle. The gospel is preached unto the poor. The gospel is preached unto the poor. It's a miracle because I was saved by a miracle and now I'm going and sharing it. It's a miracle when saved people preach the gospel. It's a sad state, but it's the truth. It's a miracle that we have a church here that wants to preach the gospel and get people saved. That's a miracle. So... Let's stay at it. Follow Christ. Follow Jesus. Do what Jesus did. What did he do? The first one we have is he went to the common people. He went to those that would hear him. And he went to where he would be heard. Now we just pray and ask God. And then do what the Lord says. Why call we him Lord and do not what he says? Well, now we know what he says. Okay, so step one. Let's follow him in this manner. Amen. Thank you, Father, for your word. I pray, God, that you would help us to find the common people that want to hear and to be led to the places where we will be heard. Because, Lord, we want that miracle to come true where the poor have the gospel preached unto them, where those that are needy have the gospel preached to them, where those that, that, that long after you or seeking after you have the gospel preached unto them. Just use us as vessels, Lord. Help us to be fit for the Master's use so that we can do your will, Lord. It's what we desire as a church. 
I know we fall short. Lord, forgive us. Cleanse us of our sins and all of our unrighteousness where we, where we have heard the word and, and, and not done it. We're building so often our house on sand and on earth and, and, uh, and it's shaky. Help us to know you, the rock. Help us to build upon you, the rock. Help us to, to do as you do, Lord. And thereby we'll be strong and thereby we'll be blessed. And bless others. We'll give you all the praise and all the glory. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, we'll find another hymn. Three twenty five. Let's try that one. Three twenty five. Trust and obey. Trust and obey. A simple cycle that we go through. It's not easy. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still, and with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus. But to trust and obey, not a shadow can rise, not a cloud in the skies, but a smile quickly drives it away. Not a doubt nor a fear, not a sigh nor a tear, can abide while we trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. On the fourth, but we never can prove the delights of his love until all on the altar we lay. For the favor he shows and the joy he bestows are for them who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Then in fellowship sweet we will sit at his feet or we'll walk by his side in the way. What he says we will do, where he sends we will go, Never fear, only trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Amen. Good singing. Praise the Lord.